Hey, everybody. It's Anna J. Walner with the Author Library, and I'm pleased to have with me today author Bob Brill. Bob, would you like to introduce yourself? Well, gee, thank you, Anna. I'm looking, I've been looking forward to this. I didn't know you were going to be so pretty. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, it, 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 it's, uh, I, I have a good time with my books. Basically, uh, as you can tell, I've been around for a while. So, I mean, I'm no, no hiding that. And um, basically, I've written 10 books now, uh, a, a wide variety. I'm also a screenwriter. I've written about 20 screenplays and pilots. And uh, I'm also a news anchor and reporter at a Los Angeles uh, all news radio station. That's my career has been in radio for probably about you know, three years. And um, so basically, I started the Lancer Hero of the West series. Jeez, uh, uh, well, it's six books, so about seven years ago. And uh, Lancer is just a, a good guy, gunslinger, works out of Tombstone, Arizona in the early 1880s. He's buddies with Wyatt Earp, John, uh, uh, hates Johnny Ringo, good guy, uh, friend with Doc Holliday and all those legendary characters who made up everything about themselves so I can uh, make up any conversation that I want that, uh, uh, about these guys. And uh, each book is a different affair. And I say affair, not meaning affair in the traditional sense, but affair sort of like if you were a fan of The Man from Uncle, uh, each, uh, it's an episode rather than an affair, but I call it the affair. So, and the, the background that you're seeing here is um, the series is called Lancer, Hero of the West. And then the subtitle is The Blank Affair. And the first book was The Prescott Affair, which is what that is. I love the background, by the way, and the Thank gun, uh, the, the gun's not in the holster, though. That's right. And uh, that there's a reason for that. And every cover uh, has to have the holster um, by my design uh, and every publisher we've had and even when we self-published, um, no gun in the holster. And the reason for that is um, even though he's a gunslinger and he's a good guy gunslinger, Lancer is a man of nonviolence. Uh, he uses his brains first. If the brains don't solve the problem, then he goes to the brawn. And if the brawn doesn't solve the problem, he goes, if he has to, he goes to the gun and then it doesn't matter because you're dead because he's a deadly shot and no one outdraws Lancer. So um, that's, that's the kind of thing. But I wanted to give that impression of, um, and it's, Call it a political statement if you want, um, but it, it is the fact that he's a man of nonviolence and or if you prefer little violence, he'd rather not go there. But, you know, if he has to go there, he has to go there. That's, that's kind of the basics. Gotcha. You know, it's I'm, I'm uh, do you, you don't see this genre very much anymore. And that, that makes me sad because I grew up reading, you know, Larry McMurtry, Lonesome Dove still resonates with me. And my right. dad quotes it often. <laughs> Being from Texas, I really do love Westerns. What, yeah. what drew you to write this genre? Have you just always loved it? Or well, It's funny you mentioned that, that your, your father always uh, quotes in movie lines or book lines. And my, my wife gets on me that I just, when you, we were dating, you, I, I thought you were making this stuff up, but now I, I've married you. I, you talk in movie lines. And I said, well, yeah, I kind of grew up that way. <laughs> you know, I love movies and I love books. But, um, and, and that goes directly to answering your question because um, I grew up in the late 50s, early 60s, when every time you turned on the TV, nine times out of 10, there was a Western on, okay? It was this explosion of Westerns, whether it was Have Gun Will Travel or The Rebel or, um, you know, Wanted Dead or Alive or later on Bonanza, you know, these were what was on TV. And my father and I would sit there and watch these shows. My dad was a huge fan of the Westerns. Uh, once told me that he read every Zane Grey novel ever written and he was a voracious reader and I wasn't. Um, but I watched a lot of television growing up. And matter of fact, from 88 to uh, almost 11 o'clock every night, I have five days a week, Monday through Friday, I was in front of that TV. Um, but so anyway, and I had this love with my father of growing up with Westerns. And at some point as an author, um, I think uh, Lancer was probably my fourth book. Um, at some point as an author, I always wanted to tackle a Western. But the problem with Westerns is Western readers, people who love Westerns, know what they're talking about for the most part, or they think they know what they're talking about, but they're very, very particular about stuff. 
And the, the situation was, if you make a mistake, a factual mistake, they're going to call you on it. And, you know, I don't want to hear it. I just don't. You know, I, I, I love it when, like everybody else, say, hey, your books are great. I love it. I couldn't put it down. You always hate to say, yeah, you know, that wasn't correct. You know, you need to fix that, you know. And um, so basically, and a perfect example of that is like in the New Orleans affair. When I went to write the New Orleans affair, some of that takes place on a riverboat. Well, Lancer's character is basically from 1880 to about 1885, mainly 1881 to 1883 the boom time of Tombstone. And uh, since I was putting them on a riverboat, I had to give the riverboat a name. Well, I couldn't give it a name of a riverboat that maybe had sunk in 1879 or wasn't built until 1888. So the cool thing about research today, if I did this in the 80s, right, a year to write the book. Yeah. Because I'd be looking at libraries, newspapers. Libraries setting away for stuff. Well, now, factual stuff like that, you just do a quick Google search and in 30 seconds, you have your answer. So I had to, um, I did my Google search on um, records of riverboats. And I found a whole bunch of information that documented all these ri famous riverboats that had either when they were manufactured, when they went to the water, when they sunk, when they were put out of commission, when they were, they got destroyed, whatever. And so I was able to pick out Great a resource. riverboat. Yeah. And so now nobody can call me on that. But if I had not done that and I named a riverboat one that had sunk in 1877, sure enough, somebody would call you on it. So um, that's to answer your question in a nutshell, all that together. That's basically what happened. <laughs> well, I love, uh, it, so. I love, I love uh, that we have so much information at our fingertips now because, oh, yeah. yes, it's truly a testament to uh, authors who wrote historical fiction back in the 70s mm -hmm. and 80s who had to dig through all of that um, all of that research in order to uh, to, to make that uh, that time period come alive yeah. that's you know it's so much easier now yeah, um, yeah it is. <laughs> so but as a novelist what drew you into writing did like me was it just being a reader first and then uh, that natural progression or I think, I mean, what made I think, you put pen, what story made you put pen to paper? Oh, golly. Uh, well, I've been a writer since I was a kid. Uh, right. I mean, I, I think the yeah. first thing I ever did was I wrote jokes. I was probably <laughs> five years old and I was writing jokes and telling them to, uh, adults who thought I was this cute little kid. So they'd laugh and I kind of got a thrill out of that. And, um, but, uh, as I started really reading in late, elementary school and junior high school. I read, uh, I love the series and I can't think of the author's name. I, I don't know. I can't remember the names of the books, but I read this series of civil war novels because I was a civil war buff uh, when I was in junior high school. Then when I got to high school, I, and I read sports books too, because I'm a big baseball fan. And um, uh, when I got to high school, I didn't read as much. I kind of, you know, I hated school. So I just, yeah. you know, I, I tried not to do much. And uh, then when I get into my radio career, uh, and then got into news, doing news, I had to read more. Uh, but then I was reading The Wires and I was reading, you know, a lot of different stuff. So I really, I never, after that, never really became a voracious book reader. Uh, I occasionally read books, but it takes me forever to read a book. When I was uh, traveling as a national correspondent for UPI, for the radio network, um, I would travel probably about once a month. And I always take a book with me on, on a flight. And I would, the only time I read that book was when I was flying. And um, sometimes it took me a year, to, a year to finish a book, you know, but, um, uh, but as far as stories, stories are kind of easy for me. Uh, and, and the reason that is, is I'll be driving down the street and I'll see something off to the side of the road and it automatically pops in my head as a movie scene. And then as I'm driving within about 15 minutes, I've got a whole movie uh, script laying in, in my head and I have to, uh, used to just pull off the side of the road and write it down. But now I just take my phone, I hit the record button and I record, you know, my thoughts and stuff. And then I've got that file and then I throw it into my computer in this file when I get home. And then I've got probably a list of 15, 20 stories that I really want to write scripts about in addition to the 
20 that I've already written. And um, so, yeah, it's uh, it, it just pops in my head and it's just very easy for me. And I pretty much have been, you know, what we all call a pantser. You know, I know the beginning, I know the end and I know the middle is just kind of laying it out and getting there. Uh, I'm writing a script now with a friend of mine, which I've never done before. And it's a challenge and you can't do that. You know, I've had to lay out this full outline and yeah. it's tedious. We're putting scene by scene together and uh, he lives in Georgia. I live in LA. And so, you know, and we yell and scream at each other back and forth in emails and just have this really, really great time. He's a friend of mine from the seventh grade who I rehooked oh, up wow. with, uh, who's a novelist and we're writing the screenplay together. It's basically, um, uh, it's, a, it's a comedy and I won't tell you too much about it because I can't, but I will tell you it's a, it's a comedy, um, historical comedy, sort of like uh, Freaky Friday meets Back to the Future with uh, a historical white guy who gets transported to the life of a black guy. And my friend Michael Andre is black and I'm white. And of course, I, I felt I could not write this script without, without a black co-writer because right. I can't write his story and he can't write mine, even though we grew up together. And um, so it's, it's, it's happening and it's going to happen. And it's a really great story that I can't, just, I wish I could tell you about it, but I can't. I know. So, but anyway, mm -hmm. so that's, that's kind of where I, you know, stories just pop into my head to answer your question. You know, stories are like that. You know, I have the same experience when I'm doing the dishes or doing a uh, driving, you know, to the, the, the grocery store. The grocery store. Oh yeah. No, no, you don't do this. You got a dishwasher. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, yes, I do have a dishwasher, but but I still do have to. Uh, I still do have to, you know, uh -huh. yeah, sure. load it and get it up. Uh -huh. you know, right. Or folding uh -huh. laundry, or vacuuming, any any kind of mindless <laughs> task, or trying to fall asleep. That that's the, that's the best time for for an idea to pop into my head. Uh -huh. um, is when I'm trying to fall asleep and I don't want oh, to light and write it down. That and uh, but I end up doing it anyway because I know if I don't, then I won't remember it in the morning. But they always just kind of come out of nowhere, and mm -hmm. um, and some are so powerful that uh, it forces me to go ahead and start the story, and then I'm just off on a ride. Yeah, I I end up, <laughs> I end up when it happens to me, I end up whispering under the covers to, into my phone. <laughs> Somebody posted something about are you still going to wear your mask post pandemic and why and i said absolutely i commented back i said absolutely because i talk when i'm in the grocery store i talk mm -hmm. out loud to my characters and this way nobody thinks i'm crazy <laughs> because i will i'll i'll be practicing dialogue while while i'm you know in the produce section and you know picking out you know what frozen dinners i want and I'm sitting here practicing dialogue and you know, nobody can see me talking to myself silently. They don't, <laughs> they don't call the cops on me. Well, I'll be like, I, I, I'm an I author. Have, I've, I'm kind an author. Done, I've, I've kind of done that before. And uh, you know, you're, you're thinking and you're walking along and you're running and you almost run into somebody. It's like, Oh, excuse me. Excuse me. <laughs> it's, it's spontaneous. You just, mm. you can't even stop yourself. And you're just in there like, mm -hmm. and you're like, Hello. People are looking for your earbud to see if maybe you've got yeah. you know somebody in the and they're like, nope. That that's really a you, problem. You, you, you know, you really so many people walk yourself. around like this. So many people walk around like this, and it's like, I know, dude, you just ran into my car. <laughs> you know. <laughs> um. But yeah. So um. The, do you have? I I have to. I have to ask. Do you have a favorite book that resonates with you that you can read over and over? Is there one that just that 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 you have such fond memories of that if you were to pick it up today it would still evoke those same emotions and feelings because i think we all have one of those books that just so deeply resonated with us that it's like ingrained in who we are you know people always ask me who my favorite author is. i know and, right and one and one of these days i'm gonna have to come up with an answer for that because i don't have one um the closest thing i think i can think of um, there's probably two. One's a, uh, a Civil War novel called Soldiering, which is a, a diary of a Civil War soldier um, named Rice Bull. Uh, but the other, 
to be really honest, this is going to sound really strange. Okay. It's going to sound really weird. Hey, we're out there. nothing strange. Well, <laughs> everything's strange. Everything's strange. Yeah. You know, this, um, it's called The Prince and Selected Discourses. And it's written by Nicola Machiavelli. And for those who maybe don't know, Machiavelli uh, was uh, back in the heyday of Italy when Italy was divided up into all these principalities and he was in Venice and, or Venice, I believe it was Venice. Anyway, uh, he was the most dastardly politician, just a, just a real piece of work, a real scum of the earth. And the only reason that I, anything that he writes resonates or wrote resonates with me. And you can basically, all you have to do is read what's called the Prince and the Selected Discourses, um, is I am a huge fan of two things, uh, logic and irony. I love those two things. And it, it comes out in pretty much every script or book I write. And, and uh, it just kind of flows that way. And those, I'm a big fan of them. And Nicola Machiavelli, as bad a person, human being as he was, he was two things. He was very logical. And that comes out in his writing. And he was very, his life was very ironic. And the perfect example of that is he was a politician. And he writes that as a politician, you, when you finally work your way up to the top, you get elected. The first thing you do is get rid of everybody who helped get you there. And when he talks about get, getting rid of, he talks about killing. Yeah. Okay. Uh, they're, they're gone forever because they know how you got there. They know the inner workings of you. And so you have to get rid of them so that you stay on top so they can't take you down. And the irony is that that is just the way he lived his life. And as dashly that is, that is, I mean, the stuff that he writes kind of stick has stuck with me. Not that I would follow what he does. It's just, it's just so logical. And so um, it's like one, one plus two equals three. You know, it's like math, you know, <laughs> it's just, it's just so logical and it's, it's ironic. And that, I, that is probably, I read that probably as a high school kid. And it stuck with me all, all my life and uh, also stuck with me. I was like, I don't want to be that. <laughs> yeah. right. right. Well, Bob, thank you so much for, for taking the time out of your day to come and chat with me. Oh, and, no, great. Um, I, I cannot wait to, uh, to see what, I, I'm, keep me up to date. Email me about that, that, that movie. Oh, the uh, because it sounds yeah, yeah. the one that we can't talk about, but uh, oh, okay. yes, but yes. when but when uh, when things are a little closer, I, I want to make sure to uh, to check it out and spread the word sure, because sure. it sounds awesome, and I, I I'd really love to to check it out. I will duck in one final note here. Uh, I, yeah. I want uh, we've got um, later this year we have a documentary that I shot uh, coming out. Um, it's with the distributors now. It'll be out later this year. We don't know where yet, but it's called um, uh, Shaken the Great Silmar Earthquake. And because this is the 50th anniversary of the uh, earthquake that shook Los Angeles and mainly Silmar, uh, the community of Silmar in 1971. And I was a senior in Silmar High School then. And we went wow. back and did this documentary on the 50th anniversary. Uh, and it's an hour long documentary. It'll be out, like I said, later this year. And uh, the website oh, for that is shakenthemovie.com. You can see some background and some of the interviews and stuff on that. Um, and the next book, when I do get a chance to sit down and write it, is going to be The Virginia City Affair. Lancer Hero of the West, Virginia City Affair. And it's outlined, it just hasn't been written yet. So we'll take a look at that. But this has been great. Thank you so much, Anna. I, I appreciate uh, uh, sitting here chatting with you. It's been good. Well, everybody, make sure to check out Bill's links in the uh, the description below. You did below. it. You did it. Uh, everybody calls me Bill. But I'm Bob, <laughs> Bob bro. Bob. You know, since Bob. elementary school, I kid you not, since element, and I just answered, I laugh about it because since elementary school, some of my closest friends have always called me Bill. That's okay. People call Bob me on and, and they run it together and it just, but I had to point it out because you didn't, I, I didn't want you to feel bad when somebody sent you an email and said, did you just call him Bill? <laughs> no, people call me Anna because Frozen is so big right now. It's actually, right. it's 
Anna. It's I just know, Anna. You're from it's Texas. just plain Anna. Yeah, it, for me, yeah, exactly. Uh, so thank you, uh, guys. I will have Bob Brills um, link in the description below. Got it right that time. And um, uh, make sure to, to check those out and subscribe so that you don't miss out on uh, uh, the next guest that we have coming. And uh, Bob, just thank you again so much for taking time out of your busy schedule. Oh, you're very welcome. To talk to me today. It's I been a pleasure. It. It's been a pleasure. All right, guys, stay safe, stay healthy, and we'll see you again soon. Bye.